Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this time. We bless your name for your goodness. Thank you because of what you're revealing to us. We're praying, O oh Lord, at this time, that your word will find a place in every heart in Jesus' name. And we're praying that your blessing will remain upon us as we set our hearts on fire, on the fire of the Holy Ghost, and your fire will be burning on every heart in Jesus' name. We pray that you grant us a burning conviction. You help us to stand firm on the truth till the very end. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. Be glorified in our lives every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Remain standing as you follow me, as we read together. Please say after me, my commitment. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit's power. The die is cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, promotion, position, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have time to be right, to be forced, to be top, to be recognized, to be praised, to be regarded, or to be rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean on his promise. I walk by patience. I live by prayer. I labor by power. My face is set. My gate is past. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way rough. My companions few. My guide reliable. My mission clear. I cannot be bought. I cannot be compromised. I cannot be deterred. I cannot be lured away. I cannot be turned back. I cannot be deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. Hesitate in the presence of the adversary. Negotiate at the table of the enemy. Ponder at the pool of popularity. Or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up. I won't shut up. I won't let up. Until I've stayed up, stood up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cross of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go until he comes. Give until I drop. Preach all I know. And walk until he stops me. And when he comes for his own. You will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. You can see now. God bless you. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3 at this time. We've been studying the messages of the Lord Jesus Christ to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And we've already studied six of the messages to the churches in Asia Minor. Now we come to the last, we come to the seventh one. And we're looking at a church that the Lord Jesus used a kind of language, a vocabulary. And in fact, it's only once in the whole Bible. You have this single word, lukewarm. And the Lord Jesus Christ used this word on the church in Laodicea. And as a church looked, as the Lord Jesus Christ looked at the church in Laodicea, he had something to tell that church. It's in Revelation chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 14. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, 
The saying says the amen, the faithful, and the true witness are beginning of the creation of God. What did he say to that church? I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. And I would thou wast cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spill thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. He had a counsel. He had a commandment. He had to show them the way out. He had some prescriptions he wanted to make to them. Verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and why treatment, that thou mayest be closed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And then it says, and anoint thine eyes with eyes salve, that thou mayest see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me to him that overcometh. Will I grind to sit in my throat, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church. Churches. Here the Lord Jesus Christ speaks to this church. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the faithful. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the true witness. He called the church in Laodicea a lukewarm church. Before he passed the comment and before he showed them the reality of who they were, what they were, where they were, he wanted to introduce himself first. I've told you over and over that Jesus Christ first introduced himself. And the reason he did that is to show them his credentials, that he is the one that has the final authority. It's not that he just appointed himself. The Heavenly Father appointed him and told him, that is giving all judgment, evaluation of your life, of my life, of every church in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we have been looking at it over and over, he says, I know your works. I know the hidden ones. I know the open ones. I know the ones that are visible. I know the ones that other people do not see. How did Jesus Christ himself recognize or introduce himself to the church in Laodicea? He introduced himself so that he could establish his right, his credentials, and his authority. And he said, I am the Amen. What does that mean? It means, it means this. Whatever he affirms is true. And whatever he promises is certain. And whatever he threatens is sure to come to pass. I am the Amen. When I speak, he said, angels in heaven, they say, so let it be. And even the Father will say, so it is. And then even the whole earth, earth and heaven will say, it is affirmed and confirmed. Because Jesus Christ is the Amen. As the Amen is characterized by sincerity and truth. He never says anything that the Father will not say Amen to he never says anything that angels will not say amen to. He never says anything that eternity will not prove that is certain and sure and firm as the pillars of heaven. That's why he says, I am the amen. Because of that, when he looked on the lukewarmness and the indifference and the half-heartedness and the self-deception of Laodicea, he looked at that with displeasure. The amen, the faithful, the true witness will not approve insincerity. Will not approve of insincerity. Will not have pleasure in insincerity. If you know anything about amen, there is honesty inside that amen. There is sincerity inside that amen. There is heaven's affirmation inside that amen. That's why you'll find that Jesus Christ will not approve of anything, will not have pleasure in anything that has dishonesty, that has insincerity, doubt, or any shadow of wavering in it. But then he says, it's also the true witness. That is, is the witness, the witness for God, and a witness for the truth. 
He can approve of nothing which the God of truth will not approve of. Christ is now. Look at this. This, you need to understand this one. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. At the latter part of verse 14, it says, The beginning of the creation of God. The beginning of the creation of God. What does that mean? That's what beginning. You know, there are some people, they go about um, distributing papers and selling this and selling that. Uh, they are called Jehovah's Witnesses. You know what they say about Jesus Christ? They say, Jesus Christ was the first person to be created by the Almighty God. And then they will refer to this and they will say, see, see, it. it says that Jesus Christ is the Amen and is the faithful one and is the true witness and is the beginning of the creation of God. My dear friends, today, this morning, what's the meaning of this word? The beginning. When you look at the word, the beginning, the Greek, the original language, uh, you see that word beginning as the origin, as the originator, as the author, as the first cause of the creation of God. So when you read this, all that this is saying is, Jesus Christ said, I am the beginning, I am the origin. I am the originator. I am the author. I am the first cause of the creation of God. Hey, look at this. Hey, you need to understand as you read your scriptures that Jesus Christ created this world. Almighty God created the world by the power, by the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. In the beginning was the word. Capital W. And the word, capital W, was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. He's the origin. He's the originator. He's the author. He's the first cause of everything that was made. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. Looking at it in verse 9. Ephesians chapter 3. Looking at verse 9. It tells us, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the of the world has been hid in God. God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the author. The originator, the origin, the first cause of all creation. In Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 16. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 16. For by him, Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. And for him, Jesus Christ is the origin, the originator, the author, the first cause of everything that you see today. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1, reading there in verse 2. It tells us, and he has, and as in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also, he made the world. So then you understand that Jesus Christ, the way these Jehovah's Witnesses and other calls, the way they refer to Jesus Christ, they'll say, yes, we understand. He was the first one to be created. Now you know that Jesus Christ is eternal. And that he wasn't created. He had no beginning and he has no end. In Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Unto us his son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. is referring to Jesus Christ, the child that was born in Bethlehem, the, the son that was given at Calvary, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. That's the Father of Eternity, is the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his kingdom and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. Micah chapter 5. 
talking about Jesus Christ being eternal. No beginning and no ending. He wasn't created. He had been co-equal with God, co-eternal with God, even from all eternity. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But thou Bethlehem, Ephratim, thou, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So then you know as you come to Revelation, come back to Revelation now. In Revelation you come to understand who Jesus Christ is. And Jesus Christ introduced himself to this church. He said, I am he. I am the one that is true. I am the one that is the true witness. I am the one that is the affirmation of anything and everything that the Father ev ever said. The amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning, the origin, the originator, the author, and the first cause of the creation of God. So then Jesus Christ introduced himself. And what power he has. What wisdom he has. What authority he has. He knows all things and he can do all things. Now, as he came to this church, writing to this church, sending a message to this church, he diagnosed the spiritual sickness of the Laodicean church as lukewarmness. And then he prescribed the spiritual remedy which will bring them back to spiritual health. But unfortunately, like Esau, they thought and they affirmed that they had enough when they didn't have the blessing of Abraham. No, they didn't, they didn't have the approval of the Father. And yet they said, we have enough, we have enough. Everything is going on fine. They were conceited and so they said they were rich and they had, when they had nothing. And they were Christless. They were spiritually poor, spiritually wretched, spiritually miserable, spiritually blind, spiritually naked. And there's a wonderful verse in the Bible. Look at this. In Psalm 36. Psalm 36, verse 2. Uh, and it shows the danger of the people that behave like the Laodicean church and they flatter themselves until their iniquities are stinking in the nostrils of the Almighty God. In Psalm 36, Verse 2, for he flatters himself in his own eyes. He flatters himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. There are people like that. They just flatter themselves as if we're all right. Everything is okay. We're spiritually all right. There's nothing wrong with us when everything is wrong with them. There are three points we're going to look at at the message today. As you look at this message, number one, there is Christ's uh, perception of the lukewarm. Christ's perception of the lukewarm. He looks at the lukewarm. And he knows that this is lukewarmness. And he perceives the lukewarmness. Point number two, Christ's prescriptions to the lukewarm. Christ's prescriptions to the lukewarm. Here he acts as the great physician. And he knows that the body of believers there, those who are professing to be believers, they were sick. And they didn't know it. They were dying. They didn't know it. And then, as a doctor, as the great physician, he made prescriptions for them. Christ's prescriptions to the lukewarm. Point number three. Christ's precept and promise to the lukewarm. Christ's precept. And if they carry out that precept, then there's going to be a promise to follow. Christ's precept and promise to the lukewarm. I come to point number one. Christ's perception of the lukewarm. I come back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading to you from verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write... These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wast cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. 
because thou seest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and, and, and blind and naked. That's the perception of the Lord. Now, you know that Jesus Christ, if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, in his earthly ministry, he always used illustrations that the people will understand. He came to some of these Jews, and many of them, they were farmers. And as he looked at them, and he knew that they understood the language of the farm very well, he said, look up here. A farmer went forth, a sower went forth to sow. And then he was by the seaside. As he was by the seaside, speaking to the people that knew about fishing, he said, do you know what? The kingdom of God. It's like a man that threw a net into the sea and then got a lot of fish. Some good, some bad. The bad ones he threw back into the sea and then the good ones he collected. And as he looked at the women that were there, he said, you know, the kingdom of God is like women that will take the dough and then they will put the yeast inside leaven and then the thing will swell up. He says, that's how the kingdom of God is. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ looked at this church, the spiritual condition of the church, lukewarmness, was something they will understand very well. Listen to this. You see, that city, Laodicea, was not very far from Colossae and Hierapolis. But uh, Colossae and Hierapolis, they had two opposite virtues. I mean, I'm talking naturally now. Because, you see, in Laodicea, there wasn't good water to drink. Therefore, they depended on Hierapolis and Colossae at the same time. In the district of Hierapolis, there were hot mineral springs. Water that would be very, very hot when coming from the springs. And it was very good to drink. So, they, they conducted, they had pipes, conduits, that came from these Hierapolis unto um, Laodicea. But you see these conduits that his pipes, they were on ground. And as the water was coming, by the time it got to Laodicea, it was no more hot and it was not cold, it was lukewarm. On the other hand, in Colossae, there was cold water. Fresh, cold water. And those who needed cold water, instead of running there, all they, were wanted, all they wanted to do was also have conduit. And this conduit also was on ground. And then the sun will be shining. And the cold water will come from Colossae. By the time it gets to uh, Laodicea, again, it was lukewarm. And when the people saw that water was coming, and they'll rush in there and take the water and put it in their mouth, it was not sitting. And they couldn't drink it. Whether from the hot spring, because it's not lukewarm, or the cold spring, it was lukewarm now. Coming from both directions, mixing together, everything was lukewarm. Therefore, they spewed everything away. And Jesus said, Laodicea, 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 that's exactly how you are spiritually. Neither cold nor hot. And he said, because you are nauseating, and I cannot swallow you. And I cannot accept you into the kingdom of God because of your spiritual condition. There's only one thing I will do. Do you know what I will do? They, was, they were listening. Look at those people that took the water. And they put it in their mouth and it is lukewarm. What have they done? They spilled the water out. That's what I'm going to do. Because you are neither cold nor hot, but you are lukewarm. I will spill you out of my mouth. Uh, if, as you look at the letter here, the message here, uh, you'll discover something. That Christ had nothing to praise, to condemn in this church. Uh, you know that in the other churches, even though he will tell them that you've left your first love, he'll first of all say, I know your works, I know your charity, I know your patience, I know this, I know this. But then he'll say, I have a few things against you. He comes to another church and he says, yes, before I even deal with the Jezebel in your midst, I have some good things about you. Your patience and your service and your works and your works now, they are more than the first birth. I have this against you. In the case of the Laodicean church, the Lord Jesus Christ did not have an isolated single point to praise them about. It was all lukewarmness. I'm asking you today in your own life, your spiritual life, what can Christ see? 
What will the Lord Jesus Christ see? Even if he wants you to correct this and correct this and correct that, is there one single thing he can praise you about? Christ had nothing. Absolutely nothing to commend in this church in their lukewarmness, no seating condition. They had lost everything worthy of praise. Their Christian profession was flabby and anemic. They don't have any dynamite within. No blood, no life flow within. They were not on fire for Christ. They had compromised their Christian conviction and zeal, and they felt comfortable and complacent. They boasted that they were rich, but they were really poor in God's sight. The city of Laodicea, you know, they tell us in history that at that time it was a wealthy banking center. And the spirit of the marketplace are taking hold of their hearts, proud and rich in straw. Straw, which will be burnt up. They were destitute and poor in gold that cannot be burnt up. And although Christ threatened to vomit them out of his mouth, he offered them an opportunity. If they will repent, there was still a chance. Now, when the Lord speaks about neither cold nor hot, neither up nor down, neither in nor out, neither serious nor negligent, just there, so-so, so-so Christian, just there. They won't run, but they won't stop. You can't push them, but they won't go out. Those kinds of Christians, as you look at them in the Bible, how does the Bible describe them? What does the Bible say about them? How can you tell from Scripture to know whether you are of their side or not? I turn to Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10. I'm looking at it in verse 2. In Hosea chapter 10, verse 2. Here is what the Lord is saying about these people. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. You see, when the heart is divided, I, I want to love God. I give a part of my heart to God. I give a part of my heart to the world. Neither cold nor hot. Not denying Christ. Not rejecting Christ. Not saying that Christ does not exist, only that we're not going to serve him with our whole heart. A patch to the world, a patch to pleasure, a patch to self-will, a patch to personal things, and then a little patch unto the Lord. And that's what the Lord is talking about. Not seeking the Lord, not following the Lord with all your heart. In Numbers chapter 32. Numbers chapter 32. And I'm reading there in verse 11. Numbers 32, verse 11. Surely none of these men, none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob, unto Jacob. Why? Because they have not wholeheartedly, they have not wholly completely followed me you see what the lord is saying the lord is saying what he wants is wholeheartedness what he wants is seriousness without interruption without dilution what he wants is for that water to be hot not lukewarm what he wants is for you to be on fire for the lord not just so so we're pushing on we're trying I'm not backsliding yet. I've not gone yet. I'm still here. Yes, I know I'm not the best, but I'm still there. I know I'm not pushing too much. I'm not praying too much. I'm not reading the Bible too much. Yes, I know that, you know, if everybody were like me here, nothing will be done at all, but I'm still there. Just be praying for me. He doesn't want that in our lives. He doesn't want you to be lukewarm. He wants you either in completely, or then if you're out, we know you're out. It says, I would rather that you're cold or hot. It, in fact, you know backsliders, that's how backsliders talk. They don't know they're backsliding. Just like these people in Laodicea, they didn't know that they had gone, that they were backsliding, that they were poor, they were blind, they were miserable, they were wretched in the sight of the Lord until Jesus Christ began to make a revelation of who they were to them. In Proverbs chapter 14, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. 
the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. And a good man shall be satisfied from away from himself. From himself. But you see, the backslider will be filled with his own ways. Sometimes uh, I get letters from some churches. And, you know, some people will write a letter and say that, you know, our pastor is not doing well. Our pastor is not doing well. And you will think that these people that say our pastor is not doing that they, they are hot for the Lord. They are wonderful for the Lord. They are loving the Lord. And they are obedient to the word of the Lord. They are right in such a wonderful way because they are filled with their own ways. And eventually when I have opportunity to call them and I say, were well, you the one that wrote such a letter to me? And they'll say, yes, sir. We just want Christianity in our area to be up front and to be number one and to be biblical, Bible-based, scripture-based, and Holy Ghost field and everything. We want our church to be on fire. And then I begin to ask them some questions about, you know, their own personal lives, how they came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, how they're doing in their places of work, what their convictions are. And then I find that these people that are saying that pastor is not on fire they themselves are flabby they themselves are anemic spiritually they themselves are prayerless they themselves are not carrying out and they're not lifting up any biblical conviction so the lord is saying that many people that are backsliding lukewarm neither here nor there they, they do not understand that they themselves they have a problem they need to deal with and that's why as you read in hebrews chapter 5 hebrews chapter 5 reading from verse 11 hebrews chapter 5 verse 11 and let me read this to you open your bible open your bible hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11 and uh, you know it says here, of whom we have many things to say, and had to be understood, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Now this year, ye are dull of hearing. They still had a pastor. They still had a messenger of the Lord because they said to the angel of the church in Laodicea, to the leader, to the servant of the church in Laodicea, right. But maybe the preacher there understood and he saw that the people, they, they were dull of hearing. Dull of hearing. Because it says in verse 12, But when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need to, be, uh, to, to teach one, ye, ye, ye have need of one, that one teach you again, which be the very first principles of the oracles of God. And are become as such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, uh, some of you, you need to understand, uh, sometimes when I want to make somebody understand something. Sometimes I don't talk, I act. And let me show you an example. Uh, you know, sometimes we've been here now for so many years. I mean, in this Deeper Life Bible Church. And once in a while, I take some people by surprise. Those early days, uh, people could see me very easily because we are not as many as this. And there were some people that, you know, whenever anybody preached, uh, those days, there were some individuals that were, you know, criticized the message of that pastor and the message of that pastor and the message of that pastor. They'll call me whatever they called me at that time. They'll say, hey, you know, we want real serious messages. We want people that can read the word and interpret the word, apply the word, and set us on fire and make us on the go on evangelism and holiness and everything. And if I find that somebody is complaining every much, a uh, uh, brother A preached, he says the preaching is not good. A uh, brother B preached and said the preaching is not good. And sister so and so preached and they said the preaching is not good. I said, all right, in my heart. I say, I I'm going to catch this man. Then when we're having a program, it may be a seminar or whatever, I then will write a topic and then and throw it at him. I say, this time I want to hear good preaching because you are a good preacher. Everybody else, you know, we don't know how to preach. A state representative, that's what we call them at that time. That state representative does not know how to preach. That person does not know how to preach. Now it's in your hand. Give it to us. And then, while the seminar is going on, I'll stay at the back and le listen to this great, powerful, perfect preacher. And this fellow will fumble. The grammar, you will stop your ears. 
you'll be very careful not to write down everything he says because it will lead you astray. And then after he has finished, I will smile. And then, you know, sometimes, you know, I use some methods. I don't talk immediately. I just pass by. I look at his face. How are you? Then they will not run to me and rush to me and say, they don't know how to preach. Then one day I say, say, you don't come again. What's the matter? Oh, he says, now nah, I understand. It takes the grace of God. You know, there are some people that all they do when they come to church is criticize. Brother so-and-so is preaching. It's not good. So-and-so is doing this. It's not good. They themselves... The time they ought to be teachers, they do not know the very first principles of the word of God. Instead of going on their knees, that Lord, I know myself. My quiet time is not all right. My personal life is not all right. Instead of looking at other people, criticizing the people that are doing their best. Help me, Lord. I don't want to look at anybody anymore. Those people you are criticizing, it may not be all right in your sight. They are doing their best. And God knows that even though they have a little strength, a little ability, they are pushing all the ability they have, all the conviction they have into what they are doing. Stop criticizing other people and look at yourself and look at what the Lord is saying. Saying, this is what I have against you. That you are busy examining other people, polishing up other people, wanting other people to be perfect. When you yourself, there is something wrong with you. That's what the Lord was telling them. Now he said, if you don't change, you are selling the Laodicean church, I will spew you out of my mouth. What does that mean? I will spew you out of my mouth. Uh, come and look at this in Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, verse 33. Exodus 32. And I'm reading from verse 33. It, it says over here in verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Him will I blot out of my book. That is, I'll spew him away. I'll take him away. I'll remove him. He will not be in the midst of the people of God anymore. Uh, can you see that these Laodicean people that were congratulating themselves were rich, everything is okay, everything is all right, and nothing was all right at all with them. And Jesus did not even have a single point of commendation or praise for them. It tells us in uh, Isaiah chapter at 44. Here is their condition. Isaiah chapter 44. I'm reading to you from verse 20. Isaiah 24 from verse 20. It says, He feedeth on ashes. A depraved, a deceived heart has turned him aside that he cannot deliver a soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? Am I not deceiving myself? Am I not just flattering myself, thinking that I'm better than other people? And when every, anybody does anything, I'm full of criticism instead of looking at my own life. In the church of Laodicea, that's exactly how they were. They thought everything was all right when nothing was all right at all. I come to point number two. Christ's prescriptions to the lukewarm. As a doctor, doctor prescribes medicine for a sick human body. So the great physician prescribes remedy to their sick, anemic, spiritual body. For their lukewarmness, Christ prescribed zeal and repentance. Now, please follow me. You see, as the Lord Jesus Christ described the church, and he told them, you are neither hot nor cold. All I can say about you is, you are lukewarm. Not only that, he began to say, here is your condition, the poverty, the wretchedness, the misery, and the blindness, and then uh, the, 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 the spiritual condition, the nakedness. He then, one by one, he began to take those things one by one, and he prescribed the solution to each of those problems. It's like when you go to the doctor, you have more than one ailment, more than one sickness you are thinking about that is bothering you, and he checks you through. First of all, he gives a diagnosis. And then he says, this is a problem, this is a problem. And for each of those problems, he's going to make some prescription. 
that if you will follow this uh, prescription and you will use this thing according to the prescription of the doctor, it says, hopefully, everything will be all right. That's exactly what Jesus Christ is doing over here. One, they had the problem of lukewarmness. What's the prescription for that? Zeal and repentance. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, as we have come over here, and I've been, I've been watching, I've been watching. And that's the reason I, I do things the way I, I've been doing things, uh, you know, this time that we come to this Congress. I've been watching, I see how things are. Sometimes I sit somewhere just quietly, and then I watch how things are going on. And from the things I see, I can see that here is a problem, here is a problem, here is a problem of these individuals. And then we can have the prescription. If there is lukewarmness, the prescription against lukewarmness or to lukewarmness is repentance and zeal. The zeal of the Lord. Then too, they had spiritual poverty, wretchedness and, and misery. They all go together. The poverty, the wretchedness, and the misery. He counseled them to buy from him, not from the world. Buy of me gold. You know, immediately some people read that. They say, uh-huh, they're aware. Jesus said, buy gold. Yes, from which market? Is it from your market over there? He said, from me. What kind of gold do you buy from the Lord Jesus Christ? And already, you understand, Laodicea was a banking center. Already, these Laodiceans were saying, we have money, we're rich. He wasn't talking of the physical, natural thing. He was talking about being rich in faith and rich towards God and rich in love and rich in spiritual matters. And he put all those things that cannot be destroyed, the faith and the love and the eternal realities and eternal inheritance. He put that as gold, something that is indestructible. And he tells you where to buy that. He didn't say you should buy that from the supermarket there or from your market over there. He said, buy of me. How do you buy something from Jesus? By consecration and faith in the Lord. It says you'll get on your knees. You'll consecrate your life to him and you will see the quality of that consecration. And the quality of that consecration is more than money. And then it will give you something that is greater than gold. The love of God in your heart. And then the richness of the mercy of God and the grace of God. When he gives you that, that's what he's telling you. And then for the spiritual nakedness. He counseled them that they should get white raiment. And once again, the white raiment is not talking about the, the one that we put on now. It's talking about the robe of righteousness. And it says, the only place you can get that, you get that from him as well. It's not the white garment that those uh, occultic uh, prayer houses wear that they buy from the market. You buy this from the Lord. The robe of righteousness is the purity of heart. It's the sanctification. Is a holiness. And then it says for their spiritual blindness. Christ prescribed, they'll get eye salve. What you call today, eye drop. So that as you put it on your eyes, then you'll be able to have a clear vision from the Lord. Again, you're not getting this from the doctor. You're not getting this from the uh, optometrist or whoever. You are getting this not from the pharmacy. You are getting from the Lord himself. So that this spiritual eye salve, you put it on and then you have a clear vision. And it is then you'll be able to see eternal realities. Gold here, just emblematic of pure religion, undefiled before God. That which makes us truly rich in the sight of God. The white treatment refers to salvation and righteousness that we obtain by faith in Christ. And the eyes represents the grace of God that we receive through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that enables men and women, anyone receiving that grace, that were blind before, to become spiritually clear. Because their spiritual condition is no more, they're no more blind to the love of God. They can see clearly. They see the love of God. They see the provision of the gospel. They see the loveliness of the person and the work of Christ. They see the beauty of holiness and they see the glory that is to come. The weight of eternal glory as they relate to the Lord. And that's what the Lord is, is telling us. And he, say, they, he says they should get this from him. And look at the, the use of the word by. As you look at your Bible, the word of God in Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. 
I'm reading there from verse 23, and then we'll jump down to verse 26. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Buy the truth and sell it not. You understand that truth is, is so is priceless. And it's neither gold nor currency that you'll be able to buy the truth. But you buy the truth as you come to the Lord. And, and you're searching. And you are passionate. And you want the love of God in your heart. And you love the truth of the word of God so much. You give time. You give your consecration. You give everything it will take so you have the truth of the word of God. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Verse 26, my son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. That's what the Lord is telling us. That's how you buy what the Lord is asking you to come and buy from him. In Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. From verse 1. Isaiah 55. One, oh, everyone that thirsteth. That already shows you how to buy. Have thirst. Spiritual thirst. Spiritual hunger. Spiritual desire. Your heart will be panting after God. You are not satisfied with the condition in which you find yourself. Somebody was talking to me during this Congress. And a person was saying, I can't quote the exact words, but this is the, this is the tenor of what uh, the person was saying. That with all the good, good messages we're hearing here, and the way the preachers are passionate, desirous, and it's like the preachers want us to just be sold out to the Lord completely. The person said, I remember the early years of deeper life in the 70s. When the messages were not as rich, as deep as this. Because of the level of understanding of the people at that time. And yet, when we finish a message at that time, some people will not know the time for food or the time for lunch. They'll be lost in prayer. Tears coming out of their eyes. And it was not hypocritical praying. It was not a kind of prayer that some people pray today. To shout so much. Only to silence other people. Or to clap their hands so that we can stop. That's enough, that's enough, that's enough. Not that kind of prayer. But they'll be lost in prayer. And you will find that even when we at that time will make announcements, now we're going to eat, we're going to eat, and the people, you'll not be able to stop them. They'll still be praying. And the spiritual life at that time was very rich. And what are we after? Are we not after the spiritual life of everyone turning around so that the power of the Lord and the purity of the gospel will be revealed Visible in every life. What are we after? Are we after just finish the message, rush on, rush on, rush on, do another thing? Are we not here for transformation? That the revival of holiness will come back upon our lives again. And today you find people that are spiritually anemic, poor, wretched, blind. That if Jesus will come today, there is no hope for them. Yet those people are the people that are in a hurry. And sometimes you find in a congregation of many, many thousands of people, there will be five people, ten people. These ten people, they would rather want to go and sleep. They don't want anything we're talking about. And instead of just sneaking out privately on their own to go and sleep, they want to sleep. Instead of sneaking out Going out, going to rest, saying, that's enough for me. I want to remain lukewarm. I don't want so much fire. I don't want so much Bible. I don't want so many references. That's enough for me. I can't take in any more. I'm saturated now. My cup is so small that what you are pouring in now will not go in. Instead of them taking their little cup and going to sleep, they will be disturbing us here. Because I will not hear, nobody else must hear. 
Because what you are saying now, I don't need it. Nobody else needs it. Because all that you are teaching now is too deep for me. It's too high for me. It's too broad for me. And we don't need, I don't need that. Because you don't need it, other people don't need it. Understand, my friend. Some of you here, you are just a coordinator of about 200 people. I have over here national overseers that are teaching and helping developing a whole country. And if you a coordinator, over 200 people, you are tired. And then because you cannot take in, will you not give me chance to help my region overseers, my state overseers, my national overseers? Or do you think because you are fed up, because what I have spoken for 30 minutes, that's enough for you. You think it's enough for national overseer. Because you said, I'm all right now. My faith is all right now. I'm encouraged now. I've got to my limit now. You think you've got to your limit. But I'm about my region of overseers, my state of overseers, national overseers that I need to teach. Here I have on the platform with me our national overseer from Russia. And if he tells you stories of what is hearing, what is happening in Russia, you'll be surprised. And I need to feed him. And there's no other place to feed him. I need to encourage him. There's no other place to encourage him. I need to fire him up. There's no other place to put the fire in his soul. And then because you, coordinator of a small church somewhere, because what you have been, that's enough, that's enough. If it's enough for you, I have a lot of people that are older than you are that are in serious ministry more than you are, and it's not enough for them. Keep quiet and shut up. And give me chance, whether you give me or not, I'll still take it anyway. And give me chance to be able to teach people that have a ministry. And that's why I've been going around and I pick out the people that they have nothing doing. They only come here to disturb and to moderate and to guard and to, and to limit what we're doing. When I see people like that, I say, this one doesn't have a ministry. This one doesn't know why he's here. This one doesn't know that we have some people here that have ministry from heaven. And we need to put something in their lives. And I remove them, I say, go out or go to the back so that we can have a chance to talk to the people that want to hear. We are here in Jesus' name. If you're still happy, you're still there. I say, we're here in Jesus' name. Uh, aren't you grateful to God that, you know, I've been preaching since all this time. I preached, uh, you know, at the retreat, and I shouted, shouted, shouted. And then immediately I finished. That same night when I finished the retreat here, I traveled to South Africa and did some more preaching, and then I ran back, and then here am I, and I'm still shouting again. Uh, God must have given me a voice to shout for a particular purpose. And there's no other person to shout at. You are here. All the shouting I want to do, I'll, I'll put my shouting on you before you go. In fact, by the time you get back home and you're sleeping like this, you'll hear my shout in your ear. <laughs> and you'll wake up again. Everybody praise the Lord. So you see, this is what the Lord was saying. He was saying they should buy for me. They needed passion. They needed something, fire in their soul. And uh, what you used to buy, I said, it's not money. It's not currency. In Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah 55, I'm reading from verse 1. Oh, everyone that thirsted, come to the waters. He that has no money, come ye and buy. You don't have money, come and buy. If we don't have money, what are we going to buy with? Buy and eat and ye. Buy one wine and milk without money and without price. It's saying it's without the human natural price. It's not the money you spend in the market. It tells us, come on now to New Testament in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 44. Matthew 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man has found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. It's talking about the treasures of the kingdom, and the precious peculiar inheritance we have in the kingdom. 
And it says, you come to the Lord. You lay everything on the altar. What you have, who you are, your certificate. And you say, nothing else matters to me. I want to get into the deep things of the kingdom of God. That's what the Lord is telling you. Now, when he told them to buy gold, I told you already that the gold there is not the natural, physical metal that, uh, that you see. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. It is comparing something to gold. And it says in verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. It talks about the faith that may be tried in the fire, and that faith is greater, greater, greater than gold. Then it talks about a robe that you will come and buy from him white robes in Psalm 132. Psalm 132. And I'm reading to you from verse uh, 9 and verse 16. Psalm 132, verse 9. Let the priests be clothed with righteousness. Let the saints shout for joy. Then in verse 16 it says... I will also clothe our priests with salvation, and our saints shall shout aloud for joy. So then, when the Lord is talking about coming to buy from him white robes, so that your nakedness will not be seen, it's actually talking of something precious, something eternal, something special. You get from him the robe of righteousness and of salvation. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 8. Revelation chapter 19. I'm reading to you from verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. It's very clear then, as the Lord told this church, the Laodicean church, what they needed. It was talking about spiritual things. They were concentrating on physical, mundane things. That's why they were saying they were all right. And they were rich. And they had need of nothing. Probably in the physical, in the natural, they might have been all right. But now the Lord was telling them they were not all right at all. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 3. Reading now from verse 15. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. In verse 18, I counsel you. Here is my plea with you. Here is my concern for you. Here is my commandment for you. I counsel you that you buy of me gold tried in the fire. That thou mayest be rich, rich in faith, rich in spiritual matters, and rich towards God. And then, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, so that your nakedness, your shame, shame of iniquity, and shame of backsliding, and shame of unconfessed, uncleansed sin, so that that shame do not will not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salves. Now your eyes are dim, almost blind, and you cannot see spiritual realities. You cannot see as Christ sees, as God sees, and you cannot see the future. And your horizon is bound about by a little circle. My job, my life, my health, my clothing, my marriage, my children, my this. A little circle. Will you get eyes out from the Lord so that he'll anoint your eyes? And then you'll be able to see eternal realities. You'll be able to see the future, the glory that lies ahead. Now, he comes to the last part after he had spoken about the prescription. He now comes to the precept as well as to the promise. First of all, the precept. The precept. The precept is a commandment. The precept is what the Lord was demanding. 
from this church, everyone in that church, what they ought to do. In verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Uh, can you look up here for a moment? Uh, sometimes uh, look up here. When uh, we, I think sometimes we we'll behave like children, like little, little children, little, little children. When somebody finds in your life their spirit, their blemishes and spots and traces of spiritual sickness. And he comes to you and he says, now this is not right. You cannot continue like this. This must not be so. You must change and turn and repent and call upon the name of the Lord. Fall on your faces and forget food and forget friend and forget every other thing and seek the face of the Lord. Why is it the pastor at this time does not love us? Because he wants us to get to heaven. He doesn't love us. And because he wants us to repent, he doesn't love us. Because he wants us to be on fire for God, he doesn't love us. But it's like when we were uh, very young. I still remember one sister now, a sister to my, uh, to my mother, younger sister. Whenever I had a wound in my leg, and then the thing would be gathering gangrene, gangrene, that is green and, you know, very, some pulse on it. If not, sister, I remember even her name, very gentle, very nice. Uh, wait, how did you get this wound? Then I will tell her, I, can't, I could tell her anything because she was always very nice. And we'll say, that's all right. We'll just uh, use water and it will not pain me at all. It will just be very nice. But the thing will be getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And then my father will see that uh, so and say, when did you get this one? I'll be shivering because I knew what he will do. Say, sit down here. Then he'll go and put water on the fire. And this water will be boiling. And he'll put a rag inside that uh, water, almost like boiling. Put it like this. Put, hey, put it here, put it here. Put it on this thing. I will cry. Then, and he will do that until the thing was healed. In my heart, you know, as a young child, I said, if this man will die, so that whenever I had so, it will be that my auntie alone that will see it. And if that had happened, you will not see me walking up. My leg would have been rotting. The person that actually loved me was my father to treat my, that leg and to make sure that that leg was healed. That's why I'm acting to you like my father. And I put the hot water there. So that by the grace of God, all the spiritual source we have that have not been healed, we still have one day left. Hot water is coming. They will be healed in Jesus' name. That's why we're not patching ourselves. That's why we're looking at this and we're saying, this is a soul. This is a lukewarmness. This is not all right. Let's get on fire. And by the grace of God, we're going to get on fire in Jesus' name. Now, as I look at this precept, see the precept here and see what the Lord Jesus was saying. He said, therefore be zealous and repent. Have you seen that for five churches said, just repent. In, a, in the Ephesians church, repent. Remember, do the first works, repent. And then when he came to the church in Tatara, again he said, I give her space to repent, and she has not repented of fornication. I'm going to come. I will cast her in a bed of affliction, except she repents. And then he comes to Sardis. He says, you have a name that you live, but you are dead. And I'm calling upon you, and I'm asking you, strengthen the things that remain. Watch now in all things and repent and he comes to this church now and he says i still have the same message for you and it is that you will see your lukewarm condition and then you will repent he says now i'm standing at the door and i'm knocking if any man hear my voice and open the door i will come into him and you will stop our fellowship with him don't you want the lot of fellowship with you 
But he says, while you are lukewarm, while you are neither cold nor hot, I cannot fellowship with you. I'm standing at the door right now. And I want to enter. I'm bringing fire from the altar of heaven. And I'm bringing the zeal you need. And the power you need. And the strength you need. And the holiness you need. If you will open the door, I will come in. Then he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, when are you going to open the door? You've been here since Monday night. When are you going to open the door? That Jesus will do something. A transforming work in your life. To him that overcometh. I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Even as I have also overcome. And I am seated. I am set down with my father on his throne. He that has ear to hear. Do we have ears this afternoon here? I said we have, do you want to hear today? He that has ear, let him hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. If you have heard, rise up and show the Lord that you have heard. That you have heard. That you are willing to repent. You are willing to turn around. And you are willing to respond to the rebuke of the Lord. You are willing to respond to the challenge of the Lord. You are willing to respond to all the exhortation and all the invitation that the Lord is giving you. Saying, I want a change. I want a transformation formation. I'm calling upon you that things will not be like they were before. It will not be like in a crusade. It will not be like a general retreat. It will be like in a real congress where we fall upon our faces and we call upon the name of the Lord and we say, Lord, 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 help us, help us, wake us up. Neither be cold, nor lukewarm, just let the fire of the Lord fall upon your soul today and see your spiritual condition. The congress is almost coming to an end. What transformation has happened? What conviction do you have yet? What has happened to your prayer life? What has happened to your vow? What decisions have you made since we began? Why don't you call upon the Lord right now and say, Lord, I have heard. Lord, I have heard. Lord, I have heard. I will not be lukewarm anymore. I will not be cold anymore. Do something in me.